you're here and we could connect and celebrate your work. Um, that's, I think, all I've got, right? Josh, you want to flip to the agenda? All right, so here's what we're doing today. First, we're going to talk about what is visual strategy? We keep using that term. And then three reasons why visual strategy helps you win with some examples for each. Um, then we're going to hear a worker's perspective from Bethany Meyer from Oakland Education Association. Yay. Um, and then Josh and I will do a little more storytelling of inspiration from solidarity, our work staging the movement for the Green New Deal. Um, hopefully we'll have at least 15 minutes at the end for questions, if not more. Um, super excited to hear what's on your mind. Um, and if you have to drop off early, we're just going to put in the chat for the first time right now. Um, a feedback form. We really are curious what is most useful and least useful to you all in the labor movement, to our friends. Um, please fill that out if you ha um, have the have a chance. Um, all right, onward. We're going to start today with an image that I bet you have seen before. Yeah. Uh, put a put a, a emoji in the chat if you uh, have feelings about Scabby the Rat, negative or positive. Um, this is a very familiar image to a lot of the labor movement, right? Um, so starting here, what does this, what does Scabby the Rat do? Um, Scabby the Rat is a quick visual shortcut that helps call out bosses. Um, it makes super clear to the public, it makes super legible that this site is a greedy union busting company that, and that workers will not be silenced about that. And it's also kind of fun. It creates a shared culture within the labor movement. We can joke about Scabby the Rat and take pictures and he, he's weird and scabby, but he's ours, we're the labor movement. Um, so it's um, it's one object, but it does a lot of different things at the same time. I'm seeing a lot of love for Scabby here in the chat. Um, it's doing a lot of things at the same time. Um, and the things that make it work are very specific and concrete. For example, it would not be the same if we made a tiny drawing of the rat and put it in front of a building. It wouldn't work if we were in a cultural context where people revered and celebrated rats. It relies on the fact that there's some negative associations with rats in this country. Um, and it wouldn't be the same if we set the same exact rat up in our neighbor's yard or around the corner or someplace else. So the location and how it's made and what it is, is what makes it work. Um, this is an example of a visual strategy. It's a visual component of a larger strategy that includes negotiations and press and picket line and social media. If just putting the rat out in front of a business alone wouldn't do the job. Um, so as we're moving forward, does this bring to mind people other examples of visual strategies from campaigns you work on? Just shout out if you have any associations coming to mind of a, a thing that you've seen in the labor movement, a visual strategy. Um, picket signs, class. Thanks, Alex, for kicking us off. If people have a, just an image of a particular picket sign come to mind or a slogan, all the same shirt, crowds of red t-shirts, big countdown clock in a public square, banners or tents for an occupation. Wow, yeah, this is a crowd that knows. The giant five for 15 letters, we're gonna talk about those in a minute. One job should be enough for Unite Here versus Marriott. Yeah, that was a great one. Um, yeah, so people know there, there's lots of visual strategies operating in the movement. Josh, you want to tell us about how we define this? Yeah, so we're going to spend this call talking about visual strategy. It's probably a new term uh, because it's a fairly new term. Um, and for us, visual strategy is an off, uh, offhand way of talking about visuals as strategy. So there's a lot of strategies operating in your campaign. You probably have organizing strategies, bargaining strategies, communication strategies, um, which are all part of an overarching plan to get us where we need to go. And we usually try and plan all our different strategies in conjunction with each other to work together, not to work you know, one after the other or as an afterthought. So we're gonna talk about what it means um, to think about visuals as strategy in that context. Um, and for us, this is the working definition we've been using. Um, visual strategy is planning the images we're all going to remember. It's creating the images our members and their communities we use to internalize our full power and taking control of the images we use to communicate ourselves to the public. Um, 
visual strategy is the tool that allows us to show the public who we are and visual strategy is the tool that allows us to show, to show ourselves who we are. So we're gonna be talking about a lot of how those different elements operate in this and how to think strategically about the images that make up your painting. Um, one of the ways to think through that, um, this is an example timeline of uh, how that would happen through a campaign and how that syncs up with the organizing in other lanes of your work. So we've broken it down to four phases here. That first phase, you've got developing a visual identity. You know, this is like what colors, what shapes, what slogans, what tone of voice are going to help us get our goals. Um, and you can develop a visual identity in a committee in your union, or you can develop it with just a couple leaders. Um, it's really up to how, how that process runs the best. Um, and it involves talking about your job, your demands, your target, and figuring out how to make them clear and, and palpable um, to yourselves and to people who are seeing your organizing. Um, once you have your visual identity, you've got that, that, that number two production right there. Um, so we've got to start making this thing. This is making the signs and banners. It's also making uh, social media and email posts. Like we have to produce everything that lets people know who we are, which leads uh, us to the, the third point, number three there, distributing your identity, right? Once you have uh, things that tell the story of who you are, we need to actually get those out to our, our, our base and to the public. Um, so using photos, putting them online, helping people to see your movement, helping the movement to see itself or the union to see itself. Um, I'll often default to movement just because we do a lot of trainings that are outside of the labor movement. Um, uh, saying movement as a term. Um, usually this starts at the same time as recruitment starts. Uh, so if you're seeing it on the timeline there, it's like halfway through production, people are starting to recruit for that big action. Um, and every time that we put up a photo in the email or the Zoom RSVP form, people are seeing our movement and getting that, that identity out there before, number four there, the big action, when we finally take action. Um, and when we're in the streets, uh, visual strategy is considering what visuals do we need to tell a powerful story in that moment of who we are. And staging and documentation are also an essential part of building power and telling that story, making people feel and look powerful. And we'll get into the particulars of all of these with the various examples we're gonna go through. Great, so when, um, when some people see the last slide with images of people creating ideas and making art and taking it out into the street, some people are like, wow, this is gonna be awesome. Art is so fun. And other people, probably not the folks on this call, but perhaps your comrades are like, oh, painting banners is fun, but it's extra, it's decoration. I'm gonna go get back to the real work. Um, and we wanna say that we're excited to talk to folks um, regardless of what, whether you think this is fun or not, because the point is, is ex it's extremely strategic. When we leave the creation of visuals as window dressing, when we treat it as window dressing, we leave a lot of power on the table. And here's three reasons why. One, visual strategy sways how much power bosses think we have. Two, visual strategy helps us win because it demonstrates and strengthens workers' unity. And three, it helps us win because it shows the public and the media who the labor movement is. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about each of those pieces of visual strategy, how it operates and give examples. Moving on, number one, um, sway, visual strategy helps us win because it sways how much power bosses think we have. What do we mean by that? Um, next. Here's an example of a tried and true visual strategy in the labor movement. Make signs before the strike start, starts show, to show the boss how serious you are about the strike. Take a photo of all your signs to show them. Yahtzee used this strategy really successfully just recently. That's what you're seeing on this image. Um, I know I saw this tweet everywhere um, and it's how I learned that they were gearing up to go on strike. Um, in our era of social media, this strategy is extremely potent. Um, cause it wouldn't have gone all the news wouldn't have gone all over Twitter and Instagram if there wasn't a picture of all those signs piled up and it's a really beautiful picture, right? Um, it's well lit and you can see all the signs and the composition is interesting, but most people didn't see this photo and think that it was staged. It was candid, but 
this is the theatrical stagehands union. Someone staged this photo really well. And that's part of why it was so resonant and it went everywhere and built the threat for a strike. Next. Um, here's another example of a, what you can do with the before the action threat from our friends in the climate justice movement. In 2014, the People's Climate March was gearing up to be the largest climate march in history. Uh, and it was the first time many union groups were stepping out on climate justice. And we set up a warehouse to make art before the march and opened that warehouse, four stories of people making art um, a week, opened it to the press a week before the mobilization. And tons of articles started coming out about what was going to happen at the march. Um, in fact, some cameras came and filmed footage that got put in the back of the taxi cabs in New York City, which single-handedly must have recruited at least another 50,000 people to this mass march. Um, and it helped define the story of that moment, that climate change isn't just an issue for people who like going hiking, that it's an issue of justice and survival. And we told that story to the public before the march even happened. So when they showed up, they were prepared to participate in the story. And also we primed the press on what story we wanted them to tell on the day of the action by having spokespeople in this art space holding up the very props you're gonna see. Next. Um, so here's some data that backs up, backs this point up. Um, one sociological study Josh and I like introduces the acronym WONK, which stands for Worthy, Unified, Numerous, and Committed. And what's been proven is that politicians' level of response to protest corresponds with whether or not the protest appears to be quote unquote WONK. Um, so you show, so how do you show that you're worthy, unified, numerous, and committed? Visuals really help you do that. Um, here you see some photos from a fight to cancel Amazon's plans for a headquarter in Queens, which you might know we won. <laughs> um, and this campaign shows us that Wonk isn't just about corporate targets um, or isn't just about political targets, that it's really useful um, with uh, all different kinds of bosses and corporate targets. Um, so when the headquarters were announced, um, a lot of people were really mad and as you can expect, the fight against Amazon and Queens was a big, sprawling, messy coalitional efforts. There were four different coalitional tables with many ideological tensions and politics between them, and we were not showing up as a unified front all the time. Um, and Amazon is a big boss. We had to be unified to win. Um, so Josh and I made these, started by making these 200 frowny-faced boxes. And we took them out to all different kinds of actions where diff different groups um, were holding, could hold them. And it projected to the public the underlying unity um, across New York City and made the level of activity happening uh, visible. And Amazon got scared. Um, the week after we dropped the boxes, they hired a new PR firm. Uh, that started placing smiling photos of kids holding the smiling back boxes in the media, and it became a battle of the box. Um, is Amazon a friendly smile or a sinister frown? Um, a few months later, Amazon backed down and won, and this image on the top right was the one that accompanied the breaking news update in New York Times. So it communicated very clearly the kind of people power that had just beat this international mega corporation. And the frown was used as the shorthand for that unified people power. Um, so we've covered a bit about the production of signs and banners and props, um, visuals, all of that. And we'll cover a bit more in a minute, but. Uh, part of visuals is how we look and feel in the street. Um, because raw attendance at our actions doesn't automatically translate into an experience of power at the rally or on camera, there's a lot of factors for this. And one of the reasons that we have signs and banners is that they help our members feel powerful and seen. Um, but where we stand, how we stand, also has a big impact on how we look and feel in the street. Um, so if you've read the last Labor Notes magazine, these diagrams might look familiar. There's, we have an article in there about the specifics of this example. Um, but this is one of the techniques that we use with rallies. Um, if you look at the little mannequin on the microphone, you can see them on the left and right side. On the left, uh, that speaker is standing apart from the crowd. They're talking to the crowd. And on the right side, they're standing in the crowd and talking to the press and the rest of the world. Um, this is two classic setups for how people do rallies. 
And there's good reasons to do both the left and right side, uh, especially once you get to a large rally with amplification. But one of the things that we really experience is that people very often do the left side setup when their members would feel more empowered and look more empowered if they did the right side. Um, I'm gonna page through. So one of the big reasons for doing the right side besides members feeling powerful is also that it looks much better on camera. Um, these are the best images you would be able to get from both of these rallies. This is what's gonna show up in the paper, but also what's gonna show up in internal social media, how your people are going to see themselves afterwards um, through their own, own posting. Um, and if you look at these two images, um, you know, which image makes the rally look larger? That bottom one really uh, shows the attendance in a way that the top doesn't. Uh, which one makes the event look worker run? One of the things about staging is it shows uh, a hierarchy between the speaker and the workers and whether workers are in fact centered in the event. Um, which event makes the speaker feel more trustworthy? Um, I certainly see that bottom right one and, and identify with the speaker much more because they're being physically vouched for by the people standing next to them. Um, and these are, this is the same event, this is the same number of people and you get vastly different stories through the images. Um, and when our comms people wanna share an action with our membership afterwards um, or share an event with another union, our experience is gonna be heavily mediated by these factors of where we stand, how we stand, how we stage the rally. And there's all kinds of staging techniques for rallies, for marches, for strikes that help our members feel and look powerful when we're in the street. So this is part of thinking through the visuals is thinking through making an event that people will feel and look powerful in. Um, here's some real world examples of this uh, from Sunrise. And it's hard to get an exact like A-B test on this, but this is the, the same location, uh, same group of people. Um, and you can see that the left and right sides just have very different feelings as an event. You know, that right side image, it really puts you in the event. You're picturing yourself being part of it. The left side image is very much like pushes us back as an, an, as an observer. And there's really just um, a few staging techniques that are changing that whole thing. Um, so uh, visual strategy in the street with staging, it uh, helps us conceive of ourselves as a larger movement. Um, and it helps change how many people we think attend. And it really helps clarify a relationship between it being worker run um, or the speaker being the star of the show. Uh, and yes, we can share these slides. Um, one of the easiest tips that we have on how to stage more powerful actions in the street um, is to read some version, whatever works for you specifically of this script at the beginning of the event. Um, and that script is, uh, most of our people can't be here today. They're stuck at home. They're stuck at work. Maybe they don't even realize that they're a part of this yet. They're watching us through the news and social media and feeling isolated and alone. So I need all of us to reach through the camera to everyone that's out there. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. To everyone at home um, and let the people watch it know that you're a part of this. And the key for us is that line reach through the camera that we've seen that at rallies, it can very dramatically change the presence that people have there and how empowered they feel about being seen in public space and reaching out um, to a, a broader movement than just the people who showed up on a given day. Uh, Rachel, back to you. Um, so thanks, John. <laughs> um, so all of that was why visual strategy helps us show bosses how powerful we are. And now we're gonna talk about the ways visual strategy helps us show ourselves how powerful we are um, by, as we say, demonstrating and strengthening work workers' unity. Next. Um, let's start with this example from the 5 for 15. Is there anyone who's been part of the 5 for 15 on this call? I'd love if you shouted it out. I'm curious. Um, I'm sure there's many of you who are familiar with this on the call, probably much more familiar than I am. Yup, William says. Um, the Fight for 15 was started by fast food workers, um, like many campaigns before it, to raise wages. Um, and one thing that was different was that there's a visionary demand, 15 for literally everyone, um, expressed in a poetic way, the Fight for 15 at the center of this campaign. Um, and to me, it's an example of how poetics are not window dressing, um, that workers who are able to see themselves in this demand and get jazzed about it 
um, and act in more visionary ways. And we had many more wins than many less ambitious minimum wage campaigns under the heading of Fight for 15. I see Jackie raising her hand too. So how did visuals help with this? Um, on the left is a giant prop that I was on a team that helped create for a day of action in New York City that we knew would get a lot of press coverage. And within a few months, we started seeing people mimic it in all different places. Um, these big 15s that hovered above the crowd and were sharp and tough and easy to photograph and memorable and fun. And it happened completely without a coordinated plan. People just saw the examples and started doing it. Um, center right, you see this image that says 15 in a union. Josh and I snapped this picture a few years later when we were supporting a, a small rally in Detroit. Um, and we saw it pop over the crowd and said, hey, that looks like just like the one we made in New York City. And we went to go say hi. So next slide. Um, the work, here's what the back looked like. The workers holding the signs were like, oh yeah, we saw the photos of the big 15 in New York and it inspired us to up our game and make these big visuals. Um, and it was really working years later. So as an aside, this happened at an action day that was very busy and we don't know who these people in this photo are. So if you do, or if we have anyone in Detroit here, like, please let us know. <laughs> um, uh, we'd love to connect. Um, Josh, you want to take on from here? Yep. Um, oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Um, so i uh, going to jump back to that example in a minute, but uh, one of the things with visual strategy, and especially for you out there who are interested in the organizing end of this, less than the actual colors and shapes end of this, um, our experience with coaching is that coaching is much more effective when we can show people images. Um, if we can show people an image of the action that we're asking them to take, it really boosts the trainee's confidence and it makes people more comfortable being seen and doing the action. This is especially helpful for actions that involve a level of personal risk, which I think is very interesting. Um, and as a result, it dramatically reduces the amount of time that we spend training someone to have that image of the action they're trying to take. So if you are, say, coaching a contract action team leader and you need them to lead an action at their work site that they have no experience of previously being part of, and that may involve some risk to their job, being able to show them imagery or video of people doing this powerfully that they can see themselves in, that they can imagine being in that space. Um, our experience is that those kinds of things dramatically reduce training time and can scale up. And, it, and this is especially not only that, but after they take action, if you're hoping that uh, the strategy is to have other work sites see that action and be inspired by it, and for this to spread that way, then showing people actions is a great way to get them primed to then reshare the action that they are taking in a way to, to, to actually organize at speed and scale. Um, and one of the great examples of this is that fight for 15, 15, like these, these groups were not talking to each other. This did not happen through direct training. People saw it, they understood how to do it, and they went and did it. That was the training arc. Um, another good example of that is uh, the way that Red for Ed picked up. In, at a larger scale than the mass calls because people could see it, they could identify with it, and they could be ready to go out and do it um, purely through the image sharing. And so this for us is a big part of where the strategy comes into visual strategy is planning your movement in a way that the, the, the union and the broader coalition of unions can see themselves and can share this stuff through imagery um, in especially for circumstances where direct training cannot fill that gap. Um, so what's unique about this story? As Josh said, this is a replicable things happen all the time. Um, to answer why moments like this are powerful, we're gonna get in a little bit to the mechanics of production. Um, we like to think of ways that you can make art as being kind of on a spectrum. Um, on the left of the screen, here's an image from the Movement for Black Lives. And it's a really clear example of what we call a decentralized approach. Everyone shows up at the rally with their own stuff, with makes their own slogans and their own visual choices. And you show that you're paying attention to the movement by mirroring the words and the layout and the colors that you see online or in public. 
Um, and this is an essential way the mass movements grow and, and build power. Um, and it really takes on, on a lot of power at a massive scale. Um, on the other side, on the right, is a fully centralized approach. These are signs from 32BJ, and they communicate a pretty clear flex of power. Our signs say who we are in full color, and they're a little glossy, perfectly round cut, not cheap. Um, and it says, we got this handled. We got time and money to show you who we are. And it's a clear flex. Um, but for the workers, it's a pretty passive experience. You show up, you hold the signs. There's not anything on that sign that helps deepen your connection to the story of why you're part of your union, necessarily. Um, now there's this middle ground that we like to call collective production. And that's what we saw in the teacher strikes, Red for Ed and Fight for 15, and that we'll be hearing about from Bethany soon. And we wanna talk a little bit more about too. Next. Um, in collective production, we're using techniques like stenciling, silk screening, projecting and tracing and painting in banners that work best in a group. They require some preparation, um, uh, but you can learn the skills that you need really fast. So you don't have to be quote unquote good at art to help. Um, and making art together this way mirrors the ethos of the labor movement because it's a way that we're all working together to achieve our goals. And the most important thing is not what I say, it's what we say, what we wanna to say together in this artwork. Um, these are processes that require preparation. So the message gets determined before you're in the room painting and the art production itself is a community event that's about celebrating and building pride in who we are as workers, what we're fighting for, why our unions matter. So this kind of work opens up a huge avenue for connection between workers. And I wanna drill a little bit into why this works, even if it might seem obvious or just palpable. Um, so you have more language to help persuade other people to do it with you, if that's why you're here. Um, so in this moment, as we approach the two year mark of the pandemic, people are screaming for connection, right? And they're craving structure and purpose to feed for why we feel connected to each other. And in the years ahead, we know that we need unions to be a place where people find that meaning. Um, for the science brain amongst us, what happens in an art build is an example of what you can call midline integration. It ta it's tasks you're doing on the left and right side of your body um, that help sync up your feelings and your thinking and help you have a grounded and whole experience. And we also know that groups doing activities with their hands and bodies together operate as kind of co-regulation of each other's nervous system. And it creates the physiological conditions that allow people to be persistent, to take risks together and to keep fighting. And wow, do we need that right now and in the years ahead. Um, the result of this kind of meaningful process makes physical things that build a sense of ownership over the union. We literally made them together. They belong to us. So this is all to say setting up a committee or a crew in your union that leads a collective production is a way that you can really deepen the connection to your union's campaign and connect those feelings of participation in the union in a very genuine whole way. Um. So we've talked about uh, how visual strategy sways how much power bosses think you have, how it demonstrates the strength of work. It demonstrates and strengthens worker unity. Um, now we're gonna talk about how it shows the public and the media who the labor movement is with a couple of quick examples here and then talk through some of the uh, teacher strike. Um, so this right here is, uh, these are signs and banners and pins that we made with Caring Across Generations. Caring Across Generations is a coalition of elders, people with disabilities, and care workers who provide care for each other. Um, this is at a summit in Detroit. That's why you're seeing the uh, labor meal in the background. Um, but the stuff we produced here, um, care works traditionally excluded, uh, not just from labor organizing, but from who we think of as a worker. There's a lot of gender and history in that. Um, and we're all also contesting stereotypes about elders as cute and passive. Um, there's a number of these pins that say, uh, I've worked exploitive hard that elders could wear to also position themselves as former workers in this context. Um, and the banners that you're seeing are modeled after suffragette banners. You can see in the top right, there's a couple finished ones with the fringe on them. 
you know, really trying to pull that long history of getting gendered work seen as uh, labor and deserving of rights. Um, and you can see here how the visuals are shaping the story of who, uh, of, <clears throat> uh, who we are and that the images of people producing those signs and banners is furthering that identity of care workers and elders and people with disabilities as workers. Um, the art bill itself is functioning to actually perpetuate that story of, of uh, powerful labor happening, um, powerful labor that isn't protected or respected. And these images, because they're happening before the action, right? Because they're happening when comms, the comm strategy is doing recruitment for an action or the organizing or recruitment strategy is doing recruitment, having these show up before an action helps to also align with the other strategies um, of, of a campaign. Uh, this is a second example right here. Um, this is an identity developed from a pipeline fight in Southern Pennsylvania. Uh, the media was largely covering this fight with images of machinery and construction. They were very much making it about the machines and not the people. Um, and the way the story was being told invisibilized both the local county that was being bulldozed, but also that most of the labor and the companies were coming in from out of state. Um, and so by creating a visual identity that was rooted in the local county itself and local pride in this way, um, it, it uh, forced a story about the quality and honor of local people's lives and of how the labor on this pipeline is actually being done. And two of the takeaways I think here that might be most um, appropriate for people in this uh, audience is that turning our meetings into community potluck events, that was a big part of successfully organizing new members, including workers. Um, one of the things for us is to really question the like, what is the, the visual idea of what your normal functions as a union or as an entity should be, because it may not be the most powerful story to just talk about them in the, the boring procedural ways. Um, and that a large number of our core volunteers had house painting and construction experience. That's where they were coming from. And uh, so the art production style you're seeing is adjusted to be things that they would be empowered producing. Um, and uh, one of the, the key things with that, uh, many movements, perhaps most movements, um, find freedom in painting their own individualized images on, on the, the uh, visuals. But these volunteers really found painting in assembly line styles and producing at scale, something that was already designed was their power and where they found the pride of being able to like precisely make something that uh, uh, was a pre-made design, um, which was an interesting consideration of changing the visual production to match the base that we were organizing. Oh, I was on mute. So this work, visuals, it projects what's possible. It supercharges moments of possibility. It helps unions grow, it helps workers grow, it helps the public understand what's going on and stand with us. And so of course, it makes bosses more scared of us. Um, one of the most powerful examples of all this recently that I don't need to tell you all about is Red for Ed movement. So I'm really excited to get to hear more about this from the ground. Um, and I'm gonna pass it back to Sarah to introduce Bethany Meyer. Hi, thanks so much. Um, and I just wanted to <clears throat> interject really quick too that I was so excited uh, when Look Loud came to Labor Notes because uh, I had the chance to work uh, with the Los Angeles teachers when they had their massive strike. I was working for a teachers union uh, during the Red for Ed wave and was in Oklahoma and got to go to LA and um, was just so moved by the sort of imagery and particularly in LA, the way that people talked about the art build and the way the experience of being in the street with the like beautiful, both beautiful images, uh, the, the specificity about the messages that was, it just was so clear um, on the signs and in the way people talked about it. I had never heard such unity of message among like tens of thousands of people. And it just all felt like it was reflected back uh, through the art. And so I, that just was an extremely powerful experience for me. And um, so I, you know, I'm excited to help like spread this message and was so excited to have uh, to connect with Bethany um, at the Oakland Education Association, which was one of these locals that uh, took on the art build as a model. And so um, I have a couple of, um, I'll actually let Bethany Meyer, Secretary of the Oakland Education Association, introduce 
herself. And then I'm going to have some questions for her to kind of tie this in. Hi, you guys. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, I just want to say, look loud. Your work is beautiful. I love seeing all the work that you've done. It's uh, such a pleasure. Everybody, hi, my name is Bethany Meyer. I am a special education teacher at Fruitvale Elementary School in Oakland. I'm the secretary and communications director of the Oakland Education Association. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Oakland teachers strike. We had a little strike y'all might've heard about. I love how that picture of Dolores Huerta, I'm in it and I'm cut out of that picture. I swear I, I marched with Dolores. <laughs> okay, so some of these um, pictures might be recognizable to you. Um, or they, you might be seeing them for the first time, but we had a really powerful experience with our art build in Oakland. And the person who first brought the um, idea of an art build to um, OEA was Kampala Taze Ransifer, who is an amazing teacher and organizer who is out organizing right now. And um, just like the folks from Look Loud were saying, um, when this idea first came to us, Kampala brought this idea and we thought it was nuts. We're like, we're getting ready for a strike. Like we don't have time to be painting a million signs. And then she's like, oh, we're gonna do it for an entire weekend. We're gonna do this for like 10 hours on Saturday and 10 hours on Sunday. And I'm just, it, we're just like, okay, whatever you say, Kampala, right? So um, it was a lot of work, I'm not gonna lie. But that collective experience of creating art together, I can't tell you how powerful it was for us in, um, in building the unity we needed um, for our strike in pro projecting that power so that the boss could see it. I did hear from school board members that when they saw, um, and of course we had media there at the art build, right? So what she said, when we saw you racking up those signs is when we knew you guys were serious. Um, so uh, Sarah, did you have any questions for me about this or I'll just keep going like this? <laughs> I do. Well, I mean, you're, you're hitting on them, but... Um... <laughs> You know, I guess that's one question is, you know, sort of who you mentioned Kampala, Kampala brought this uh, to you, but, you know, who, who brought, how did it get decided? Was it a decision that sort of went to, um, you know, the stewards or the executive board and sort of then how did the message get out and how did you, how did you find the group of people who are going to, uh, you know, organize it and get it together? I'll be honest, Kampala wasn't even on the executive board, but she's completely undeniable. And when she decides she's going to do something, <laughs> that thing is going to happen. So like a, a lot of the like reparations for black students work, um, community coalitions, she's carried a lot of that and was visionary in bringing that to Oakland. Um, so I really want to give her credit. You'll see her in some of these pictures. And there she is in the purple shirt down there in the bottom. Um, she came, I think she learned about it after taking a trip to Milwaukee mm -hmm. and she learned about it and I, we didn't have anything to look at to really even know what she was talking about. We really just kind of went on faith. I'm, I'm just in this meeting with her and two other people, right? And putting it together, everything from we need to order burritos to here are the artists who were, are making the silk screens and here are the images that we're using that like um, really putting together um, having images to choose from and realizing like what images were most powerful to us, which in Oakland, that is a fist, right? We're not playing around with just a fist on everything. Like it was like, oh, like the one with the fist. Um, and this, uh, the red and white banners um, were, and those are hand painted by members in our garage. Like we thought we had another space come through for us and we were really worried that we couldn't rent a space, but had doing this in our union hall was a beautiful, beautiful experience. Just having it full of life where it had never been like that before. Um, how, how many people do you think it took to put it together? How, did you have, did you build a committee or was it sort of just Campella wrangling everyone? Um, it, honestly, a lot of the times in OEA, it's two or three people or at that time it'd be like me, Kampala and Shelby planning an entire <laughs> art build. I don't recommend necessarily <laughs> doing it that way. Because I mean, Kamala and I were at an art build at OEA on Mother's Day for 12 hours once. I mean, like, don't live that way. Is what I would, you know, if you, when, you, but sometimes it just starts with one person who believes in it, who gets another couple people to believe in it. And then once you pull it off one time, now sometimes our members are doing their own art builds. Oh, cool. Yeah. Like how many, how many members in their families do you think came to the first one? Oh, I don't, we probably kept track of the time. It's been a couple shh, dogs. It's been a couple of years in a whole pandemic since then. So I, I would guess like a couple hundred people came through that weekend. Wow. 
the union office was very full. So I had like some of my students and their families come through and visit. And, and I liked what, um, what you had to say earlier about that, that experience of being next to each other, that sort of co-regulating or collective experience is like really powerful emotionally. It's beautiful. Could you talk about then how you use the art? So you had all these beautiful banners, beautiful signs. What did you use them for? We've used them, I mean, we, we had, during our strike, we marched every single day. We had different actions every single day. And those came, like that big long banner you saw us with Dolores, like we had different ones all the time where it's just the OEA leadership holding the banner, taking over the street, marching, like marching to on the privatizers, marching to the district offices, marching across East Oakland to a school that um, was slated for closure. And um, here in the crowd, you can see like a couple of like beautiful OEA members. That's um, um, Andre there on the top is one of the teachers who's on the hunger strike to save um, Westlake Middle School. Um, I see like Kim, right Kim, now. teacher and her daughter. Yeah, like he's on a hunger strike right now. There's, um, there's always something happening in Oakland. Um, we use some of those images there on the left. You can see we used them when we um, started sharing our strategic plan with members. Um, members get really excited when they, people really respond to these images. People remember the experience of um, either creating the art together, carrying the art, being on strike together. And we reuse images and compile more images all the time. The ones that you see on the right are very recent. They're very recent from um, our school closure fight. Where you can see um, safe and racially, the safe and racially just um, schools that Oakland students deserve. But that no cuts, no closures, we've been using that since a strike. That was one of the first ones we ever made. So they all live in the OEA garage <laughs> and we do pull them out and then create new ones. And those tall vertical ones that you see, those are 17 feet tall. Wow. And we one time had four of those that Kampal and I put on top of a truck and took to Sacramento, which was bananas, don't do that. <laughs> I love how tall they get on that building in the bottom right. You know, I mean, you're really sort of like, it's this real physical show of, of you know. Yes, it is. Like, it's really impressive when you see those in person. Um, and yeah, it makes a really powerful statement. That's why I love seeing that big 15. Something about going vertical is, I don't know, it's very thrilling in person and makes for great photos. Now, we think because I do the media work for OEA, Two things I think about is like the having that visual consistency and sometimes just the fact that if people didn't see it, it didn't happen. You can have the most amazing march with all of your friends and if you didn't get media coverage or if there's not a great photo, it's like it didn't happen except for your, your target experiencing it. So it really kind of um, helped build OEA's profile in the community and helped members to believe in their union. I'll never forget talking, it's my, uh, my dad and my uncles were all transit mechanics and they had, and my uncle told me, oh, you're going on strike? Well, do you have signs? And I'm like, well, we make our, we make signs because we were there with our poster board, our teacher poster board. He's like, no, you'll, they'll know you're real when you have signs. Like you work for the Muni, right? You work for Bart, you have the big printed signs. And I could, I was so excited to show him what we actually did. Like, this is what we did, Uncle Mike. <laughs> um, that to me is more powerful than that, that mass produced sign. It really gives a great feeling. I love that you said that because I think uh, we hear from a lot of folks who like struggle for their members to understand, you know, if they're not already part of the core or part of, you know, the supporters that they, it's not easy to reach them and let them know sort of what work they're doing. Um, and I think people are always struggling for like social media content, like they want to be thriving, they know their members are on social media, they know that they're on email, you know, they know that they're um, engaging with visual places, but um, they don't have good photos, right, or we're using the same ones over and over again. So to be able to have this like wealth of images that I think it's powerful because they're not only you know, they're not only like rad shots of an action that let you know that you're fighting and trying to to um, improve the lives of, of your students and your members, but it says exactly what you're fighting for in, mm -hmm. in such a clear and quick way that message gets through. And so whether it was, you know, a member or somebody in the community, um, I just think that's, that's a cycle that really seems to build on itself. So I'm, I'm glad you spoke to that. Um, and I love, I wanted to highlight that story you sort of dropped before that uh, the school board member didn't said something like she didn't know that you all were serious about striking until she saw 
the sign production. Is that right? Oh yeah. She, and, and it was on the news where it just showed us moving giant stacks of signs, putting them all against the wall and are hanging up silk screens. And it's just like repetition, repetition, repetition. And she's like a school board member who used to work in the labor movement. She knew what that meant. Nope. <laughs> she, knew, she knew what that meant. Um, this one on the left is um, from an action we did with SEIU, that street mural, um, Oakland schools, uh, students deserve safe schools. We do like sort of variations on, on themes we've used. That's right in front of this, um, the district offices, which they rent very, very expensive offices while we are, you know, we're in poorly ventilated windowless classrooms. Um, so bringing that to where they have to pass it, you know, every day, um, that was that was pretty pretty wild, and we did another one just recently. Like we're all over them constantly. Um, the one on the the right is one that we did at the county board of education, and you can see like a street mural there. And we're with um, SEIU Black Organizing Project, Reparations for Black Students campaign. Um, it's a it's a big show of unity, and um, put been putting them all together like that. We had a good photographer, one thing that we work with a lot, um, mm -hmm. getting them together like that people um people get excited they do just one last question i see this coming up on uh the chat which is sort of a question about what if you've got small budgets or small um sort of comms teams you know mm -hmm. do you think this would still be replicable and we'll have rachel and josh answer that too but i was wondering if as somebody who is in your union leadership you know what how would you sort of think about that in terms of, of budget and staff our comms team right now is me. I'm like the entire comms team and I'm a full-time teacher. I think they're going to start hiring some pros for some of the social media and like press release type stuff. But we did, like Impala is good at getting the money. Like all this money wasn't sitting here in our local. It was, it was figuring out how to, for us working with the National Education Association to get grant money to fund like our work with some of our partners, like the art, the art build workers and the local artists. We work with a lot, David Solnit, right? The, the, it doesn't come from the sky, obviously money. So it's it's building connections with, with your, uh, if you have like a um, affiliate, larger affiliate to figure out what kind of grant money might be available to do this kind of work. You use these images to show them what's possible you continue to use these images to show them how powerful your work is to get more money to do more work. <laughs> like when Kapala's like asking for grant money, she's like, you're you like you either like, it's like art build stuff or like general social media stuff that we've created is what her reports are full of so that they can see what we do. So it's not just a bunch of words. That's really helpful. Thank you. And it seems like there's a whole range. Like, of course, if you if you're able to like pay local artists for original art, you know, that's uh, an incredible expenditure. But some of these two say no cuts, no closures. You know, it's um, that that some of them are. I mean, we did have like silk screens by Fabiola Ramirez and like known artists. That was like dope. That was amazing. But these uh, the ones, the main ones you see right here, that is just muslin, really inexpensive muslin that we were like like splitting and laying out and using pencils to, you know, I mean, like just laying it out and painting it. Great. Thanks. That's helpful to get the inside union take on um, the, the financial side. A anything else, Bethany, I should ask about or anything else you'd want to say about how this, how integrating art changed the culture of OEA or, or the membership or I see like from, from the moment we did the art build was the beginning of like having like our, our union office came to life. Before that, I would go for an executive board meeting or you'd go there at a random time to pick up t-shirts for your site. And then after that, I would go in and, and there's like, why? There are five meetings happening right now. Like it became a place that was actually alive to people. The people started to see it as their home. Um, when you're when you have that experience of like being next to people and painting with them and meeting workers that you didn't know before. Um, it's amazing. So as much work as it is, I would totally encourage people to, even if you're just starting small, give it a shot and do it. It's beautiful. Thanks so much, Bethany. Love these images and thanks for speaking to it. It's really excellent. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Will you stick around uh, if folks have questions? Uh, no pressure if you can't. Um, I, I can, I'll stay around for, uh, yeah, we'll do. Whenever you have to go, no worries. Thank you so much. Thanks. And I'll hand it back to you, Rachel and Josh. 
Hi again, everybody. Thanks so much for that, Bethany. I was just nodding along. I turned my camera off for a few minutes, but um, thank you so much for giving us a little bit more of the inside scoop. It's been beautiful to watch the work in Oakland just like take over the media time and time again. Um, we're going to share a little bit more now um, about the work that Josh and I have done in the fight for a Green New Deal. Um, Josh, you want to go on to the next slide? Um, and we want to share this because it's an example that gives us some, just helps us see some of the different possibilities of visual strategy from teacher strikes and opens up our imagination in even wider um, to different options. Um, so we'll talk just about this for five or 10 minutes and then use the rest of our time for questions. I'm seeing some really awesome uh, get right to it questions already in the chat. Um, so some context. Um, all of the slides we're about to show you took place in the few years before COVID hit, um, when the Green New Deal went in a course of months from an obscure concept to basically a household name or a thing that was getting chanted in the street. Uh, and we obviously didn't win a Green New Deal yet, yet. Um, but this session is not a political briefing about the status of climate justice legislation, thank goodness. Um, but uh, we feel that there's a lot to learn from this case study. So we want to bring it to y'all. Um, and for some context of Josh and my role, um, we spent about two years working very closely with Sunrise Movement, who are a youth-led climate justice movement that we've mentioned a few times, with hundreds of chapters around the country that played a major role in putting the Green New Deal on the map, um, though also working very closely with other movement groups that Josh and I ended up supporting in the process. Um, here you can see Raven and Brian, two awesome youth Sunrise leaders that we worked with in their t-shirts. Um, I'm passing it to you for the next one, right, Josh? Yep. Um, oh, great, I'm off mute. Um, Uh-oh, we lost Josh and the slides. <laughs> I bet he'll be right back. This has been happening a couple of times. Um, otherwise, um, hmm, maybe we can answer a question while we wait for him. How does that sound? Oh, oh, thanks for your patience. Hey, well, thanks. that That's was great. <laughs> Let's go oh, crazy. technological foibles is what makes us human to each other through the screen. Um, uh, we were the screen you pull them back up. Uh, and this is. now doing something weird sorry y'all bear with the technical difficulties be back in one second all right can you see that now yeah bump up one slide before that though yeah all right so back to it um this is an image of the national speaking tour that Sunrise led to pressure politicians to commit to backing the Green New Deal. This is in the spring, right after the Green New Deal is announced. It's still very much a like DC legislation. Um, that's Representative Presley speaking there. And what you're seeing here is that, that this backdrop was built from demonstration signs, um, things that could be taken out into the street. Um, and what that does is it makes sure that this event is larger than any speaker that's on the stage and Bernie was on these stages. So like it needed to be, it needed to make the movement more powerful. And when the politicians would walk out on here, it was clear that the star of this show is regular working people um, and that anybody in the audience could feel that empowerment out of it. Um, and footage off of this tour got used in articles on the Green New Deal for years because it was quite a while after the Green New Deal was Um, and because Sunrise spent a lot of time working on coalition actions, a side effect of really emphasizing the visuals as part of the strategy was that leaders who had been trained in staging techniques were then lending their skills to coalition actions they were part of. Like it gave young people um, a space to help overall movements feel more power by having all kinds of really sharp, clear, mediagenic events. Like you're seeing a DC rally up here in the top right but Sunrise kids were the people who were most effective at being able to stage that 
Um, and a lot of those groups were, were then coming to Sunrise to get that very disciplined look, whether or not it was in any way the look was related to Sunrise or the event was related visually to Sunrise. Um, what you're seeing here, this is an example of using local imagery to build power uh, for a broader coalition. Um, this is a collaboration we did with artists who lived and worked in Detroit. Shout out to uh, Nick Pazan and Darius Faber, um, who designed the banner and the fists you're seeing above. Um, and you're seeing the typography here is from old, old auto body shops in the bottom left, and the fists are pulled from the auto workers mural. And this is an example of really using local imagery to create a sense of a bigger movement or a movement that was really accountable to local space um, because it was pulling from the literal like uh, uh, streets of Detroit. So as the movement for the Green New Deal um, grew, Sunrise's role was often to escalate. Um, and uh, we want to share this story because um, we've been sharing a lot of examples of rallies or marches. Um, and we think often that um, the more serious um, and rigorous that we can be about staging practices when we take escalated action, the more that we can continue to um, build power instead of letting it drop off. Art isn't just for your march in the street, it's also for those escalated situations where people are risking arrest or other kinds of ways of, of turning up the heat. Um, so this is an image of an action we took um, while to occupy Nancy Pelosi's office to demand that she introduce climate legislation. Um, while this image is going on, this is in the hallway outside her office, a few dozen sunrisers are inside her office occupying. But this image in the hallway just got just as much attention, so we want to talk about it. Um, on the right, you see a diagram we made for the action beforehand in preparation. The plan was that everyone would line up to give their letter to Nancy Pelosi. That was the story of the action. Hundreds of young people with their own letters about what they love and stand to lose to climate change, waiting to get into her office to deliver it. But the problem is that that image of people lining up did not look very powerful. It's just a little line in a big wide hallway. So we trained people ahead of time to line up on both sides and to take turns stepping to the middle of the shop to fill that blank spot in the floor and make clear to the media that that was the spot to take the photo. Just by, um, just by the, the, the power of the situation, you could see with your eyes, you didn't even have to point, this is where I should stand to see the action. Um, so what you're seeing here is that what makes this image powerful is those yellow rectangles going way off into the distance, right? Like off, off over the horizon. And to pull that off, everybody in the shot had to be really present, lean back, coats behind them, signs up facing the right way. People in the back are just as essential to this image looking powerful and disciplined. And it helped create a situation in which hundreds of young people had a critical role to play in the action, even if they weren't gonna get into her office. So it was a plan that didn't just build a good photo, though this photo went everywhere and was used for a lot of recruitment and sunrise movement. It also made a really electric experience for participants holding the line together. Um, another teachable story in this action is that it's in a con congressional office building. Um, so signs weren't allowed. Um, so we had every young person put their letter in an envelope and we printed the message of our action on the envelope. So we went through security. We said, oh, no, no, it's not a sign. It's a letter. See, it says, dear Democrats on one side. Um, there's a letter inside. And that was the only way this action could happen. The visual strategy is literally what made the rest of the strategy possible. <laughs> um, next. Um, so at Sunrise Movement, as Sunrise Movement kept growing, um, jo there was too many awesome actions for Josh and I to be in the mix of nearly all of them. So we pivoted and we built this whole national training program for action art leads who were skilled up in those four phases we named initially, identity creation, art production, distribution, action staging. And this grew the movement's ability to command power so exponentially um, we could tell stories about it for days, but I wanted to lift up a, couple, a learning of ours, which is that in addition to the movement looking and feeling sharper and more powerful, we also noticed that once we built this Art Leads training system, people would get trained up through our program and then make a leap to high levels of leadership in other kinds of work within Sunrise Movement. 
They take on action lead roles, conflict mediation roles, coordination roles, because the, the act of developing their leadership to get ready for art production develops so many different kinds of central skills, logistical skills, strategy brain, relational organizing, understanding communications work. And it was all very transferable more than we'd anticipated um, to helping build the movement overall to include this in Sunrise Movement. So if a union were to take on a project like this, the point we're making here is that the opportunity to have an art committee at a local level creates a potential new entry point for people who have different interests or for younger or newer union members who don't see themselves in the roles in the union, but who might be creative or want to have fun and work with paint. Um, and that um, building space for them through an art committee can be a way into the union and a way to build their investment in the union and build their skills to match the needs. Next. Um, yeah, just in conclusion, what we saw is that investing in visual strategy and in staging particularly and in um, visual leadership development for visual strategy really grew the movement for Green New Deal to keep doing amazing things and deliver on that wonk principle um, and help grow um, skilled leaders that will be in, in many movements for years ahead uh, and change what the public's idea of what understanding what's possible was. Um, we've never been so close to climate justice legislation. I really believe it <laughs> for another time. Um, last slide. We're at the end of our training. Um, you got this. It looks like we've got a lot of awesome art activists on the call already. And also reach out if we can help. Um, here's our email address. Um, and some of you were asking some specific questions that we might or might not get into, but we have a lot of tips about sourcing paint and fabric and taking photos and working with photographers on our Instagram. That's what it's there for. Um, lastly, I'm gonna um, put in the chat again, a feedback form that we'd love if you had a second to fill out or if you want to reach out to us with more specific ways, that's a great place to start. Um, and I'll kick it back to Sarah for some Q&A. Excellent. Um, I have seen a couple of things in the chat um, and I will, um, go ahead and pull some of those, but please go ahead and either use the Q&A function or the chat. I think we have some time for that. Um, Jake asked earlier, uh, when is it effective, strategic to use satire, street theater, and creative direct actions in a campaign and why? This also suggests to me, like, you know, something I think we talk about at Labor Notes is sort of we kind of try to push back on the like tactic first uh, approach. And we kind of try and think about like your, your, your goal and your target. And then you, you know, you figure out what's going to be most effective to, to that. But I'd like to hear your perspective. This isn't a direct answer, but one of the things that um, we often run into is people will have in their head and the term that I usually hear an art action or an action that is about the creativity and like that that is the visual action. And those are great, not, not hating on them, but uh, visuals are part of literally every action and the, the bulk of actual visual work is not um, super creative original tactics, uh, but just doing a good job of telling a story at the rallies and marches that make up most of our campaigns. Um, as far as satire and stuff go, I think for me, it's whenever it matches the story that you're trying to tell. Um. um, yeah, that's what I'd say, similar to what Sarah was saying, a lot of the time we start, people get a creative idea in their head and they start a really fine tune level. And we like, really like to start visual strategies, kind of strategy, start with your goals. What are you trying to do? Then pick some strategies and pick tactics to match it. So if you are, if you end up with a strategy where you're trying to shame the boss, um, there could be a real place for satire in there. Um, I'd be careful about matching your production techniques to match your strategy, right? Because like, if you pick a satire strategy, um, and then you have a super open participatory fun art build where everyone brings their kids and makes things that look super cute, it doesn't carry that threat. So you might need a more centralized production technique that looks creepy or scary or serious to match 
uh, you know, I'm getting into the weeds a little bit here to match a satire strategy. And I think Josh and I are careful about when we use theatrical tactics because it requires a lot of discipline to pull off and it and for the the seriousness of the situation to come through. Um, and we both over time have kind of shed a lot of the maybe more interesting parts of our work. Like you'll see those really powerful images from the teachers union are just, just two colors on plain white fabric. And we focus on getting that right a lot of the time because it builds power. It does, when you were talking about the staging part, um, because uh, again, cre and I think creative direct action is a real spectrum. Like creative for uh, you know a union of artists is gonna be different than uh, creative for uh, you know a union of uh, electrical workers, but because you know we're all starting from different places um, and I think it's gonna be really impactful. It, it even made me think when you were talking about staging though, just like even when we're doing like a March on the Boss with five people, um, if anyone's been a part of an action where you like get to your destination and you haven't talked about like where to stand or who's going to talk first and like how you sort of can stand there and fumble, uh, you know, because you haven't like thought through all of the like what would be the most powerful or the most effective way to carry through your tactic once you've made it to the march, you know, the, the boss's office. I feel like the you're sort of bringing this ethos of like, how are you bringing through and thinking through um, every possible step of your tactic, including at the end when you've documented it and shared it. And so I, I think, I think you're right that like bringing those fundamentals in is uh, part of the creative part. Uh, so uh, question two, I see from uh, Renata, what are some questions you ask to an organizing committee when you're trying to determine the visual strategy? I love this one. Um, one of the things, uh, so, so part of determining the visual strategy is determining the visual identity. I'm going to jump right to that because I, I like that part. But there are there are bigger strategic questions as well. Um, and one of my favorite ones there is asking people to talk about the struggle and the injustice without ever mentioning the opponent or the direct issue that we're working on. So for labor, the, the actual labor stuff, because uh, we get really lazy about not talking about the broader aspects of who we are, um, because we can just talk about how bad Jeff Bezos is. Um, and the media does a really good job of invisibilizing our story by telling the opponent's story. So talking about who we are is a big one and talking about who we are outside of the specific injustices that we all already have the talking points on. Because if you saw the like, uh, the, the locally based examples we were doing of like a local visual identity, like that stuff comes out not from talking about the exact struggle, but by talking about the things that you're fighting for and like the community there. And that's where that power comes from. I think one of the things uh, in talking about what your broader visual strategy is on a strategic level um, is just getting really grounded in what is the arc of the campaign that we're doing. Um, and what is our comm strategy for that campaign? And what is our recruitment strategy to get people out to that action? And where are the holes in those? Because if you start really looking at them, usually there's a hole two weeks before the action when people are making up their mind, whether to show up and how enthusiastically, like whether to ask other family members and people to show up um, where you need the visual strategy to kick in um, because the organizing strategy and the comm strategy uh, don't have the things they need in that moment. Rachel, anything to add? Um, I, I think Josh, I, everything would be repetition. I'm just seeing the chat. A couple of people are like, what kind of paint do I use? So I put in a link <laughs> to, to the Instagram post that we now send folks to, because this is a very common question of uh, with like every, uh, everything that we think people often ask about paint. You're not alone if you don't know where to start. <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah, your Instagram is very helpful. Um, I liked what Josh was speaking to too, and it, it also reminds me of the teachers uh, who, you know, the Chicago teachers sort of early on did the, the schools our students deserve and the sort of like talking about what we were fighting for, you know, nurses in every school and, and how powerful that was. And it created these visuals of like drawing the sort of beautiful communities and the beautiful schools we want. Um, so being being for something can be really powerful. Uh, that's that's excellent. Uh, I'm I'm really curious about this question that Kat just asked. If I can call on someone myself, and it also speaks to one that happened earlier. I think Lizzie was the name of the person 
who Lizzie was talking about, um, what do we do if I don't have a lot of money or a lot of capacity, um, which I'm sure is a question a lot of us have. Um, and Kat has this question. I've encouraged members who are worried when the action is creative or art related because they don't consider themselves artistic to, to include or encourage their participation. So this isn't a barrier. So I think both of these are kind of questions about where to start um, in the reality of the world. And um, when we're building with new folks, um, even though it's like, oh my goodness, we could use art for so many things. And there, we have these big ideas about campaigns. We often start by saying, let's take one action together. Um, and that way it, it can be clearer or more bounded what we're making visuals for, because it's specific to a, we're going to be in this place. The banner should be this big to block the street, or like, here's the demand for this moment and learn how to build together. Um, and that can open up an opportunity to say like, hey, like, let's just do an experiment. Let's see how it goes and you can prove your point. Um, and from there, what I'd say is you don't need like, um, uh, Bethany was kind of joking, but you don't need a lot of people to do the initial stages. Often we're pretty bounded about, let's not have a committee of 20 people brainstorm our visual identity. Let's pick two or three leaders who really understand our union um, and have them have a couple meetings to visualize or to come uh, who we are and then have more people plug in when you're just painting in the lines or have more people plug in once the art is done and you're in the street um, and start people start people can pick up the bug at a different place in the cycle and then have more willingness to go deeper on the on the visioning josh you agree with me on that point or yep yeah i think one of the other things with the question about if, if you're on a shoestring budget how do you do this stuff um, it doesn't take an artist to paint signs and banners. Often it's even better to be done with someone who has alternative skills, you know, someone who was a painter or someone who was a seamstress, like a, a house painter. Um, you know, these are not skills that require a high level of creativity. They require a high level of being able to fabricate a thing. Um, so you may not need an artist, um, but if you're working with artists in uh, labor organizing, and if you're working with artists in social movements in general, there's really three ways artists get paid. One is to get paid. Um, one is to get paid by a bigger organization, like a lot of our um, larger clients uh, explicitly overpay us so that we can do volunteer work. And the other one is they're doing it as a hobby and it is personally fulfilling for them. Um, or it's fulfilling for them as an artist, which means that you might get a lot of free labor off of that and great volunteering and definitely use that, but that person will then probably take less direction and be less accountable to the movement because they're not being paid. Um, and so if you can't afford to pay an artist, uh, get used to working with someone who is sort of doing their own thing, that can be a great arrangement, but like understand it as that's the trade-off for arts being traditionally underfunded. Uh, we I also like really advocate that artists get, if, if you're asking someone to do visual strategy work, pay them the way you pay a strategist. If you're asking them to do arts production, pay them the way you pay someone who is doing a similar thing, which may be nothing. It may be free and then don't pay them. It's great. A whole spectrum here. <laughs> and we know we have locals. I mean, Bethany was referencing, you know, being able to get grants from your international um, you know, we've we've seen unions where um, you know folks can can call in from their state affiliate or regional affiliate and, and get support on things, and other folks don't have that. Some some people do have big budgets, um, and and others don't. But I do think this is something that can happen at every scale. I do also I like James' question here. I think we probably just have time for one or two more. Um, similar to budgetary constraints, time availability. James says he's working with uh, people who might be working at all different shifts. So how would you uh, maybe do a collective art production where you've got people coming in at, at all different times? I think this could make for a really fun sort of marathon event, but I don't know if you guys have any experience with that. I have, I mean, this is an interesting challenge. We haven't, I would love to work with workers that this is a challenge that we, would need to solve together. Um, the first thing that comes to mind to me is like, there's different steps of production and some of them are easier to do. And sometimes I call it like a roving meeting, right? Where it's like, when everyone can't show up at the same time, I just have lots of one-on-one -on -one conversations. So you could do a visioning process through that, right? Um, even if folks can't come to the art build um, or you could um, use a, 
durational tactic, right? Like you could do a sit-in overnight so that everyone takes a turn. Um, and a lot of people think that the only way to get folks excited about visual strategy is if they do the whole arc, the visioning and the making and the signs in the streets and the distribution, right? Like that it doesn't, but that actually found that any one of those moments alone, if done well, can build a lot of identity. People often feel tremendous pride in the art that they held at an action. Um, so it might be about picking a tactic that people can be accept, um, absorbed into over multiple periods of time, or might be about like harvesting people's opinion about the vision. Those are two forms that's, moments that seem easier. This is kind of a, uh obtuse answer. But um, for me, if your union, if your workers, if your community cannot all meet each other in the same physical space, the number one question you should ask is how do you make people feel like they have met each other in the same physical space? How do you get them that sense of community? And it might be include everybody in the art build. It might be have one group make the signs, have another group be carrying the signs into the action. It might be make real damn sure that you're getting good photos and videos that make people feel like they were there and then distributing those out to the people who are working night shift and can't participate. Um, like including your members is a, is a distribution strategy thing too. Um, and so definitely if you're already working with that different shifts limitation, um, think about a calm strategy that's going to make everybody feel like a big part of the movement. Movement's maybe the wrong word here, but like part of, of the same uh, labor struggle. I'm, I'm going to say we probably need to wrap up now. Uh, I want to real quick, um, of course, thank Rachel and Josh. And if you have follow-up questions, they have uh, included a lot of um, ways to get in touch with them, both their email address in the chat, as well as that feedback form. Maybe if you all want to drop that again. Um, and uh, I hope you'll share that with us as well. We'd love to hear sort of what, what people got from this. And uh, if people collaborate on this, we were joking on the labor notes staff. Uh, if more people used this visual strategy, uh, you know, tools and, and, um, got good at it we would have such fabulous photos to run in our magazine and on our website so we hope that you will <laughs> take them up on this and use it because it does make for striking visuals and we love that um so thank you again to you two thank you for everyone uh for supporting labor notes again check out our website labornotes.org uh we are an independent little um media and organizing project that uh but we're so lucky to have the, the support of the labor movement and um, of fabulous folks in the rest of social movements who, who reach out to us as well. Bethany, thank you so much for joining us. It was um, so impactful to have someone who'd gone through this process from the labor side join us. And uh, Rachel, Josh, anything else you'd like to say? I'll let you wrap it up. Hey, no. thanks so much. I wish we could all get off mute. That's, that's my wish. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was great talking to you. And please make better signs so that labor notes can have better imagery. That's actually a very important <laughs> community building thing. Oh, we will make this. Uh, so Josh and Rachel mentioned that they would make the slide deck available. Um, so you can reach out to them for that. And we will also post this recording on our, uh, our website and social media. So if folks weren't able to make it or if you want to share parts of it and show people what, what it is that... Uh, look loud can do, can use that video. Great. Okay. Well, with that, we'll wrap up. Thank you all uh, for joining us. Uh, make sure you continue to uh, fight the boss and we'll hopefully see you at our June <laughs> conference. Good night, everyone. We'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.